please take your seats. If you could please take your seats. All righty! If you could please take your seats. We are going to get started. Lots of time for dessert and hugs when we're done. Members and guests and those who are joining us on live stream, hello there. My name is Bruce Celery. I am the president of the Canadian Club of Toronto and your host. Thank you all for joining us today. Wow. You know, we spend so much time as Canadians communicating electronically through email and text and Twitter and Snap and Facebook and Instagram and all that stuff. But at the Canadian Club, we really believe in the power of personal connection, the power of real FaceTime on topics that matter the most to Canadians. And putting together this roster of dynamic and relevant events over the course of our season simply would not be possible without the generosity of our sponsors. So we are deeply appreciative for the support that we have received today from Kingset Capital, represented by Tom Jankos, and from Lyuna. So a round of applause for our sponsors. Thank you very much. I also want to take a moment to welcome our youth and young leaders joining us this afternoon. If you're youth and young leaders, could you give us a wave, maybe a little whoop? the back of the room here. There you go, there you go. So thank you to Bell Canada for sponsoring students from the University of Toronto's Urban Planning Program. And thank you to Julie DiLorenzo for sponsoring the students from St. Mary's Catholic Academy. Welcome. Nice. I am also delighted to note that we have a number of distinguished guests joining us for our luncheon this afternoon in addition to our esteemed head table. Uh, guests, as I name you, please stand and wave. Audience, hold your applause until the end, please. Uh, Charles Souza, former Ontario Finance Minister. There he is. Welcome, welcome. Mario Silva, former City Councilor, a member of Parliament for Davenport. Oh, you're going to applaud the whole way. Okay, I give you permission. Joe Mahavik, former City Councilor. There you are, hello. Brad Bradford, Toronto City Councilor, Beaches East York. Joe Cressy, former Toronto, or sorry, not former, Toronto, no, current, current, Toronto Councilor Spadina Fort York and not the winner of our draw. Jennifer Kelvey, Toronto Councilor Scarborough Rouge Park. Julie Dirchowitz, newly elected member of parliament for Davenport. Hello, welcome, applause to our guests, thank you. Our city has a lot to brag about. Toronto's got a lot to brag about. The Raptors, Drake, the number of cranes in the skyline. There's a lot to brag about. Toronto is the fastest growing city in North America. Very, very impressive. And with that comes a lot of opportunities, a lot of challenges, and a lot of questions. Questions about laneway housing and density along the subway lines and co-housing for young people and seniors and new models of financing and the role of architecture. Today's Deputy Mayor, Anna Bailao, knows about all of these questions and is deeply engaged in all of these questions. The Deputy Mayor chairs one of four critical decision-making committees, planning and housing. The Ward 9 City Councilor is also an executive committee member and serves on the Special Committee on Governance. In these leadership roles, tackling housing pressures is a top agenda item. Deputy Mayor Bailao, has, who has been at City Hall for nine years, is intimately familiar with the city's housing and planning concerns. She serves on the Toronto Community Housing Corporation and create TO boards. She also represents the City of Toronto at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Before politics, Deputy Mayor Bailao held senior roles in banking and healthcare IT. Toronto's housing sector, uh, housing strategy was developed 10 years ago and will be refreshed. It is helpful to take a look at what has worked well and what needs to improve. Let's learn more about that now. It is my great pleasure to pass the podium of the Canadian Club of Toronto over to you, Deputy Mayor Bailao. Thank you, Bruce. Um, 
I first want to thank Colleen because uh, as we were getting ready to come in here, she just reminded me of uh, a podcast series that she was doing, and she said, well, we have uh, Margaret Thatcher, Churchill, and, and I'm like, can you stop right there? <laughs> For the love of God, just stop. Um, but I do want to thank uh, Colleen, the board of directors, uh, and, and all the staff at the Canadian Club, uh, and John Kapubianka for putting together uh, this event to talk about housing. The reality is if nine years ago, uh, when I got elected and started talking uh, and uh, working on housing issues, if anybody was to tell me that we were going to pack a room of uh, people uh, at the Canadian Club to talk about housing, I would not believe it. And I know that many people in the housing sector that are here today would say the exactly same thing. So thank you for bringing us together to talk about this important issue. Um, uh, I do want to thank my colleagues for joining us uh, here today. Uh, I do also want to recognize two, two other former counsel counselors that Bruce didn't recognize, Councillor John Campbell and John Burnside. They're also here, so thank you all for, for uh, joining us here today. And, and I'm very pleased to, uh, to be joined by two of our city officials. They have been announced in the head table, but I have the privilege of working with these two men, and I'm very fond of them. Our chief planner, uh, Greg Linton, and our uh, executive director of the housing secretary, Sean Gadden. I'm so pleased that they were able to join us here, and uh, it's been a privilege to work with them over the years. And, of course, I think we need to thank and recognize the staff of the Roy York. Uh, I have to say I was excited because when I was in the room, I had a staffer from uh, the Royal York that peeked and said, are you Anna Bailao? <laughs> <laughs> You're Portuguese, aren't you? <laughs> I said, yes, I'm proud of you. I'm like, <laughs> so... So I think uh, we need to acknowledge this wonderful meal that we had here today. So we are here at the Royal York uh, Toronto Landmark that has greeted guests uh, from around the world, from queens to princes to rock stars. And well, I'm definitely not a queen and uh, not definitely not a rock star. Actually, let's be clear about something. There's only one rock star in the room, and his name is Sean Gatton. So <laughs> let's make that clear. <laughs> So um, I came, uh, but I, I, I would like to say that I would not exchange my role for any of these positions, my role as city councillor and as uh, deputy mayor of this city. So, um, Sean, you can keep your rock star uh, uh, and, and rock all you want. I, I'll continue to do my, my job as it is. So um, I want to start by letting you know that I came to Canada at, uh, with my family when I was uh, 15 years old. And uh, little did I know what this country held for me. I mostly remember uh, missing my friends. You know, you're 15 year old, you leave everything behind, you leave your friends, your country, and uh, I would question what this country would be like. And uh, of course, uh, I came from Portugal, so the English was limited, didn't speak a lot of, a lot of English. Um, but I remember immediately feeling a sense of opportunity. And I have to be honest with you, I could not say at the time that it was a sense of opportunity. I was too busy missing my friends and my grandmother and everything that I had left behind. But as years went by and you start looking back at feelings that you had at a, as an adult, uh, a young adult, you, you see that, yes, that's what I felt. I felt that when I got here, I felt that despite all the pain that I was going through, I sensed that this was a city and this was a country of opportunity. And as uh, time went by, uh, Toronto became my home, and a home that it would have, that I would have now the honor of being a member of city council and one of Toronto's deputy mayor. And Toronto has been good to uh, my family and me. We are a part of the diversity of Toronto, the diversity that our, our city has embraced, and uh, it is our strength. But equally true as a Torontonian and as a Canadian, I do feel a common sense of purpose. Yes, a common sense of purpose driven by our commitment to care for each other. Whether you are a member of the First Nations Indigenous communities, whether you've arrived 50 years ago or you've just landed yesterday. The bottom line is that our people, wherever they come from, they make our country and our communities a better place. 
So I believe it is our job together to work to fulfill the promise to building a caring and inclusive Canada and Toronto, a Canada and Toronto of opportunity. That's why I'm in politics and that's why I'm so honored to be speaking to you today. So in my short address today, I'm going to speak from the perspective about Toronto's current and future housing challenges. And I speak from a position of being the city's housing advocate and chair of planning and housing committee. I speak from the perspective of having seen an incredible change in our city where housing has become less attainable and less affordable. And I also speak, like many of you, as someone that tonight will have a bed and a warm place to sleep. So let's review Toronto's housing situation. Where are we today and where are we heading? Why is housing such a difficult and complicated subject when it is such a basic human right? And what must we do together to improve the housing conditions for so many Toronto residents? There are many realities um, to Toronto's current housing situation. While the city is in the midst of a condominium boom, we know that there is a significant shortage of purpose-built rental housing and an acute shortage of affordable rental homes. We also know that tonight, some 8,000 men, women, and children will be homeless or in an emergency shelter. The city's residential construction sector is firing on all cylinders. There is barely a city block downtown where there is not a construction project underway or planned. 120 cranes, that is right. That is what we have up in the air. That is the largest amount of construction cranes anywhere in North America. The only two cities uh, after us are Los Angeles and Seattle with 49 cranes each. The residential construction industry is fueling the success of our economy and providing jobs and opportunity for many. In the last five years alone, some 80,000 new condominium units have opened with many more to come. And this is all good news. This is good news. Maybe not for our chief planner, because we're always complaining that they're not fast enough. <laughs> but despite this boom, there is another story in Toronto. And I'm talking about the story of housing in Toronto where too many residents are unable to find a place to live and are spending way too much of their hard-earned income on rent. I'm talking about those who are being pushed out of our city because they cannot afford to buy a home here. I'm talking about 112,000 renters who are paying more than 50% of their income in rent, where unacceptably low social assistance rates have driven residents into shelters and homelessness. I am talking about a city where only 4,500 new built rental homes opened in the last five years, yet thousands more are needed. And I'm talking about our city where when people speak about housing, they speak about being stuck where they live, they speak about being stressed out, and they question whether they can afford to live in Toronto. Well, my friends, we have done some research and some forecasting, and we do have our work cut out for us. As you may have noticed at City Hall, we are often very consumed with the here and now, right? That's, you know, Jennifer Pagliaro, she keeps us on post on the here and now. It's the road that didn't get fixed. It's the person that needs a bed tonight. It is, uh, you know, a mom and a child that needs the shelter bed. It is us changing our minds where the next subway is going to be built. It is, it is reacting to the latest news from Queen's Park, o Ottawa. It is the here and now. But when it comes to housing, not only we must act now, we must act and plan for the future. I know, I know you're all wondering, oh, that's great. Anna's gonna now tell us about the future. Maybe she has a crystal ball, ball or black magic or voodoo. I do have to be honest, I have considered voodoo since I've started working in this file, but, but let me guarantee you it's none of that. We have simple double down and done some long-term housing market research and forecasting in the city. And today we live in uncertain times where global political and economic affairs outside of Toronto's and Canada's borders will determine much of our future. What we do know is that globally people will continue to flock to cities. The United Nations considers addressing the impact of urban growth as one of the 21st century's greatest challenges. 
The United Nations Department of Economic and Social uh, Affairs estimates that two out of every three people in the world will live in cities uh, or urban centers by 2050. The UN reports that many countries will face challenges in meeting the needs of their growth urban populations, including housing, transportation, energy systems, and other infrastructures. Sounds familiar? So, in Canada, by 2050, some 90% of our country's population will live in cities. That's 90% of this country's population. And during the next decade, Toronto alone will grow up by a million more residents. While grow we must and should, we must plan and be prepared to do more than continuing our current course. Because if we don't do more, our research has clearly demonstrated that in Toronto by 2030 and beyond, more residents will be homeless, emergency shelter stays will be much longer, waiting lists for social, supportive, and affordable housing will continue to increase, low and middle income workers will have to travel farther from work to find housing, and long-term care beds will be more challenging to find. Well, I don't believe in this kind of housing future, and I know that many of you don't either. I know that we can do better, and I know that we must do better. If we truly want to continue to be a city of opportunity, we must act aggressively to plan for a happier and more successful housing future for our city. So as the city housing advocate, one thing that has continued to surprise me over the years is how difficult and complicated the issue of housing has become. I have to be honest with you. But thinking about it and thinking about it, I, I want to share some of the conclusion that I have. I, I think I do have an answer, and, and I think that we've been afraid to talk about housing. I lost count of how many people, when I was first elected and uh, decided to start working on housing, would come up to me and say, why are you doing this? You know there's no win in housing, right? You know this is political suicide, right? Yeah. That's the answer that I got. I wish I could take a picture and send it back to some of those people. We'll do that later. Um, the reality is that, like many issues, we've been afraid to talk about housing. I think it's just very much like mental health. You know, people feel like if you talk about these issues, it shows some kind of weaknesses. And that has been uh, one of the problems. I think that housing in Canada and in our city has been so difficult as well because governments have refused to talk about it. For too long, for too long, we've left the solutions to the marketplace and we've left people to struggle on their own. And I truly believe that we are on a new course. I do believe that it is within our grasp the opportunity to uncomplicate the issue of housing and make housing less difficult. November 22nd, 2017. Anybody knows what this date means? No? Okay. Somebody should know. But you're, you're just uh, enjoying the lunch and enjoying my speech. I'll take that. <laughs> On that day, two years ago, the federal government unveiled the National Housing Strategy. After years and decades of advocacy, our country was once again taking housing seriously and providing a plan to address the housing needs of Canadians. And I know that many, many people in this room advocated for a long time for this national housing strategy, so thank you to all of you. The national housing strategy provides a human rights approach to housing and a range of funding and financing programs to support action on homelessness and housing. But equally important, the strategy provides a framework for the engagement of provinces and Alex, the Chief of Staff for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing is here, so we're very excited for the date that we can announce when the agreement between Ottawa and uh, Ontario is going to be signed. We're looking forward to that. So, um, but they have also uh, made sure that the framework engages local governments and private and nonprofit stakeholders. I have to admit that I was somewhat concerned about the potential impacts from the results of October 21st federal election. I was concerned that the next federal government be a government that would support and build on the national housing strategy. And now that the results are in, I believe that not only will our national housing strategy continue, but I do believe that there is now a unique and now opportunity 
to speed it up, to increase funding, and to improve and deepen Canada's national housing strategy. Would you agree? Yes. So we've been talking about engagement, and that's exactly what we've been doing in the last year in the city of Toronto. We've engaged about 6,000 residents across the city to talk about housing over the, these last year because we've been busy getting ready for the next 10-year housing plan. So this work has started, we've engaged, and the conversation has been uh, happening over the last few months. And we've heard from people. We've heard that people want action across the housing spectrum, from homelessness, through rental housing, through long-term care. What we've heard as well is that they want real and measurable action every day, every month, every year of this plan. And we have heard that people want a city to adopt a human rights approach to housing, respecting the dignity of people with and without a home. We have heard that City Hall, the province, and the federal government much do much, must do much more and work better together. And we have heard that the people of Toronto are ready to roll up their sleeves and contribute their expertise to making decent, secure, and affordable housing happen in our city. And I'm pleased to report that our city's officials are putting the finishing touches on the new Housing 2020-2030 Action Plan and will be shortly reporting to the city's planning and housing committee and city council. And Sean, just because you're here, you're not getting an extension on that date. It is the day that we've talked about. <laughs> so I believe that there are several ingredients to successfully addressing our city's uh, housing challenges. High on the list, is the necessary funding and financing to support this work. In particularly, money to maintain our current affordable housing, and we have a big ask this year in our budget to continue the capital repairs of TCHC. Big ask, and so we need to make sure that the city budgets, hint, hint, uh, all to my colleagues, let's work on this, continues on that path, and to expand affordable housing options and supports for our residents. But many of you have probably uh, heard me saying that I don't believe we can finance our way out of it and we can't build our way out of this issue. We need to be, to be doing both. And that is why that is no surprise that high on the list is also the city's role in the planning and approval process. In particular, speeding up the approval process and supporting housing innovation. But equally important is the need to collaborate, to work together to achieve success. I am particularly proud of City Council's um, most recent work on affordable housing and how City Councillors and the Mayor have been standing up as champions for housing. And I would like to share some examples of that with you. In 2016, the City launched the Open Door Program to provide incentives and in city land for affordable housing. To date, some 7,730 rental homes have been approved and in October, uh, 80 residents move into the first new building at 200 Madison Avenue, where the mayor and I launched this program. Councillor Paula Fletcher, our vice chair of the committee, championed the Red Door Family Shelter being included in a new condominium on Queen East. Construction is nearing completion, and next year, 96 emergency shelter beds will be provided for women and children. Talk about innovation. Councillor Perks worked with the Parkdale community to secure City's Council support for the purchase of a former LCBO site in Parkdale, which will result in up to 40 new rental and supportive homes. And the mayor just asked staff to develop a land acquisition strategy. Councillor Nunziata championed the new Weston Lawrence Cultural Community Hub. This year, the first rental housing development in Weston in more than 30 years. And uh, it just opened and providing a mix of 40, and 422 affordable and market rental housing. And just two weeks ago, Mayor Torrey, Councillor Fletcher, Councillor Bradford, and myself unveiled the plans for a new mixed incomes development on the Don Somerville Toronto Community Housing Buildings, which upon completion will provide 400 new rental homes, 120 rent geared to income units, and 100 new affordable rents. And right after the last municipal election, Mayor Tory and I announced the city's housing now uh, site to build 10,000 residential homes on 11 surplus sites. 
the first phase of this initiative, we'll, we'll be providing 3,700 affordable rental homes directly adjacent to our subway stations. These sites are being activated in local communities with support of councillors Matlow, Grimes, Crawford, and Pasternak. Actually, there are now 59 active affordable rental developments, adding for about 7,000 units. 19 of these developments are under construction, 40 are in pre-construction. Now, here are some interesting numbers I'd like to share with you. For these 59 uh, projects, the city funded $109 million with incentives in the amount of $481, so 109 cash, 481 incentives, and the federal and provincial money was $84 million. Do you want me to repeat that again? Should I repeat that again? So there's definitely some work. A topic for a further conversation. I'll be back. <laughs> so the reality is that these are but a few examples of how our city council, and I just mentioned a few councillors, but fortunately we have many that are championing these initiatives. As your city council is stepping up, supporting and advancing the housing agenda of Toronto. But I think we all understand that moving forward, it is essential to build on this work and step it up. And to advance the necessary partnerships with the development community, the nonprofit sector, and with communities across the city. Success will also require new ways of thinking and of innovation. By way of example, look at what we have accomplished with the city's laneway housing initiative. As a form of gentle densification, two years ago, former Councillor Mary Margaret McMahon and I championed a change to the city's zoning regulations to permit, to permit laneway housing. Today, laneway housing has taken off with more than 40 laneway homes approved and many more in the pipeline. Similarly, the mayor and I have asked the city's, city's chief planner to review additional ways to add gentle density to our city's neighborhoods. Essentially, we are driven to make room for people through providing more flexibility in our planning rules. That's what this is. The reality is that today, roughly 70% of Toronto's land is designated in the city's official plan as neighborhoods, where the permitted land use is restricted to low-density residential development. Meanwhile, during this past decade, the value of homes in our neighborhood zones have increased beyond the financial reach of so many residents. Reviewing and changing our official plan and zoning rules to make room for Torontonians through increased gentle density just makes sense. In addition, increased density can improve housing affordability and support the city's climate change goals. And I have to be honest with you, for me, this is also a question of equity. Who are we building this city for? Who are we leaving out if we don't deal with these issues head on? And that is why I'm hopeful that we can have an adult conversation in Toronto about neighborhood densification. In the United States, there is even a nationwide campaign supporting residential densification called Neighbors for More Neighbors. Hint, hint, anybody wants to take this on? But we can't do this work alone. We need everyone to step up and contribute to building a much better housing future for our city and our residents. And that's where you all come in. My housing vision for Toronto is a city where all work together in all corners and neighborhoods in Toronto to activate local residents and business in a campaign to decent and affordable housing. Where there is a housing 2020-2030 action plan for the city, but also neighborhood housing initiatives taking place through the city's 25 wards. These new grass root housing initiatives would be developed locally and activated with City Hall with the engagement of councillors and members of the provincial and federal governments. My housing vision for Toronto has definitely five big areas. Housing has a human right, financial tools, planning and zoning tools, strong cooperation with other orders of government, and I include the municipalities around us and a transparency and accountability in this plan. I can't wait until we dive into each of these areas over the next few months while we fine tune at council with all my colleagues in here 
and we approve the next 10-year housing plan. My housing vision for Toronto is that no one is left behind, where everyone is treated with dignity and where we set an example to the world in providing residents with access to decent, appropriate, secure, and affordable housing. I spoke earlier about the desire for a happier and more secure housing future for Toronto residents. I say this not because I wish it to be, to be true. I say this because we have the imperative to make it true. It was once said that the most reliable way to predict the future is to create it. So I will be creating it. So I hope you leave here today inspired to work better together, to innovate, and to scale up our work on affordable housing to make Toronto a better place. A place where all of our residents, regardless of their circumstances or country of origin, have a more secure and affordable housing future. A place where every 15-year-old, no matter if born here or just getting here, feels that sense of opportunity. That's my vision. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well done. Well done. All right, we've still got a time. We've got time for some questions. Uh, I'm just going to leap right in because I'm that kind of guy. Uh, number one, how do you actually go about streamlining the planning process to make decisions quicker? You, is it an app? Is it a technology? Is it people working 24 hours a day? How do you, how do you streamline the process? Okay, uh, our chief planner is close to having a heart attack, but I will. <laughs> we have a defibrillator standing by. It's yeah, fantastic. Be fine. It's going to be fine. I, I think it's a mixture of two things. I think it's, um, there's definitely a technology component to which, absolutely, and we're working on it. Uh, there is, I think, uh, two things that we're working on, which is having our planning department with more of a project management approach to some of our projects. One of the things that we keep hearing from the industry is, you know, a file gets stuck in water or a file gets stuck in one of these departments and nobody, nobody follows up. And so we want to take that approach into the, um, uh, the planning process. And then we really have to work on um, the gold star, whatever star, because nobody really believes in it, let's be honest. But I call it uh, the SWAT team approach. And that's what I've been uh, um, trying to work with, with our city is that for affordable housing, we need a SWAT team approach. Um, we need a team that is going to be concentrated in some of these big projects that is going to shepherd it through the city uh, and work with uh, the nonprofit organization and the, uh, the, or, and or the developer. What's your advice for young people who live and work in Toronto but are facing the reality of leaving the city due to being priced out? What's my advice? What's your advice? Well, uh, Get a pass on the GO train and move to Georgetown? Uh, no, uh, two advices. First of all, uh, contact all your uh, elected officials from MP to MPP and city councillor and tell them how much housing is an important issue. Uh, the second thing uh, is maybe be um, involved in a lot of the community initiatives that you're starting to see in the city. There's, there's things like the Parkdale Land Trust group that, has get, that are getting formed. These are residents actually taking initiative and uh, creating some of these projects in the communities from co-op housing to land trusts to co-housing. I, I visited a group of constituents of mine that actually created a model of co-housing. They own the house together. So, the reality is that people are living differently in our city. They want something different. And I think there's two things. The city needs to be flexible enough to acknowledge that people today live differently. That the two, the big house with the two car garage is not the way that every Torontonian wants to live. And we need to have regulations that acknowledge that. And the second thing is that um, people maybe have to uh, think about the concept that success is the single family home detached with a two car garage. Maybe they're not. And I think that more and more people now are just uh, learning how to live in, in, in a different way. What are the best in class cities around the world who are facing similar challenges but are having success, success doing things differently? Who can we look up to? Um, 
you know what? I think that there's a lot of an issue. These, this is an issue that all major sh cities are facing. We have Vancouver and Toronto, and now Montreal is starting to face a lot of these cities. But you go anywhere in North America, you go to Europe, a lot of the cities are different. Uh, uh, there's cities like Vienna that have a very different system from what we have in here. So it's not fair to compare, especially on the housing. I mean, they have a, a rental system that has been in effect for 80 years, or and so we can't compare. now. There's lots of initiatives that are being taken. Uh, I just talked about uh, the national campaign of Neighbors for More Neighbors that has been taken. Uh, I've, like, you know, there's lots of cities in uh, the United States that are looking into the missing middle and this zoning thing and getting rid of single family home uh, zoning, for example. Uh, there's uh, lots of national governments and provincial and, and, and cities that are doing also a lot of more investment and, and realizing that there's certain issues that we try to create housing policy that you cannot solve with policy. For example, you cannot have housing policy address the issue that we have unsustainable ODSB rates or disability rates. People that don't have the income and expecting us to create housing policy that is actually going to solve an income problem we we'll never get to the end of this. So I think we need to start separating the issues and be clear that there are some issues that are income related and there are some issues that are housing related. Is NIMBYism a real issue or do we just like to talk about it? And if it's a real issue, how do we address it? Because that's not one you can throw money at. No, it's not. Uh, I think, it, it, of course it is a, a real issue. People have their ideas, their perceptions, the way that they've been doing things, and change is hard for everybody, for all of us, change is hard. And I think that us that want to have those conversations have to acknowledge and see, okay, what is moving people on the other side? What is interesting on the other side? I had a big lesson with the process that we took on laneway housing, because for us, what was really interesting is the benefit that people actually saw in that. It was not about the bricks and mortars, it was actually the the social benefits that people are gonna have, their aging parents living close by, or their kids close by, or being able to babysit their grandkids because their, their family's gonna be close by. So um, I was talking with a colleague of mine uh, the other day that went on a, a, a bus tour that uh, the Land Institute did around the city to, to talk about the missing middle, and he was so amazed. He was, he's, was very skeptical about this, and he was amazed about um, how people are actually open to this idea. Why? Because it is affecting them. Because they look around their neighborhood and they say, wow, I wouldn't be able to buy my house here. My kids can't afford to be here. So what are we doing here? What kind of city are we building in here? Just because I want to have this big lot that could probably fit another house at the back and my kids could live in here. And I could. So people are starting to open up to these conversations. So I think for us politicians is really understanding the values and how these, what do people want? It, it's about people. It's not about the bricks and mortars. So to that point, uh, this question, what specific measures can gov governments and developers undertake to create new housing specifically for vulnerable people? Homeless people, people with disabilities, low income seniors, et cetera. What governments can do? Yeah, what governments and developers. It also includes developers here. Yeah, oh, well, so I think that a good step was definitely the national housing strategy setting aside a percentage that it was going to be, that has to be designated for uh, accessible housing. I think we're very much go fulfilling that at the City of Toronto. We want to respect that and have in our projects the same um, the same percentage as well. And, and I want to just emphasize that when we talk about uh, uh, accessibility, um, you know, there's... Um, Lots of organizations have been doing a lot of uh, good work in here in, in this, but there is a need for uh, um, even more work to be done because we also, and they get put, get put together, I know that a lot of organizations don't like this, but because we have an aging population, it has become even more of an important issue. Um, and, and I know that we, we need to separate it, but it, it's, it's an accessibility issue. And so I think that uh, we need to acknowledge the need. We need to create policy to make sure that it happens. Uh, and, and I think in the development industry, uh, the um, uh, welcoming of this, the creating of materials, uh, being uh, the flexibility, being flexible and innovating. Can we create a unit that can be accessible and non-accessible? Can we change? Uh, I think that that innovation and saying, yes, maybe we can create units that can be used by somebody that, need, that has accessibility issues, but if need be, cannot be accessible. So these are the innovation issues that I think we need to create to make sure that the market um, 
supports the policy that we are creating to have those percentages of accessible units. You mentioned rental inventory. It's a huge, huge issue. What is the single more, most important thing for there to be a step change in rental inventory in the city? Uh, to have more rental? To have more, but a significant increase in rental. Is it financing? Is it zoning? Is it the developers? What is it? What's the single biggest thing? I, I speak to a lot of people in the rental business, and they tell me once it starts making sense, business sense, we'll build it. Um, I can't believe that with the price of rents that we have today is not getting to get to that point, that it's making business sense. So um, I believe that land is a big issue, uh, zoning is a big issue, but creating um, uh, opportunities and understanding the industry. And, and I, I, I have to uh, uh, acknowledge some of, of the work that was done recently on, the, for example, the payments of development charges, the fact that now rental buildings pay the development charges five years uh, after. This was a huge thing for, for rental builders because it helps them with their cash flow and it helps the project make a lot of sense. So for us to understand some of these issues, how can we make sure that uh, we can actually incentivize? And as a city, using our land to create rental, and we've been doing that, we are now putting out the lands not uh, just for condominiums, but to ensure that our land is used and creating the housing that we need. And right now, there's a huge need for rental housing. And so we need to use our, uh, and to leverage our assets to create that, and the policy tools. Those are the two big things that we need to do. Federal government, provincial government, I can give you a long list. But I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you my two that, that we can do. I'm going to wrap it up with one question. This is an extraordinarily engaged audience. These are people who care about their city. They care about housing. What is your one call to action for this audience? And I'll, I'll say what I think mine is, given that we had a chance to chat in the reception beforehand, is I need to find out more about laneway housing, because that's <laughs> something that could happen in my neighborhood, and I didn't even know it was ready to go. So I promise you that I will find out more, maybe even talk to my neighbors about how that could be something that we do. What, to this room, would you say the call to action should be, given that it's gonna take all of us working together to make a significant difference? I think it's really to, do, to address the issue and to talk about the issue. Let's not be afraid to, like housing is an issue that it actually will impact the future of our city. It's not just your, the homeless person on the street or you know, the, uh, the son of your neighbor that can't come in here. When we talk about the prosperity of this city, people come here because of the quality of life. Investment comes here because of the human capital that we have. If people can't afford to live in here, we have nothing. We won't have investment. We won't have prosperity. We won't have a city of opportunity. So we need to address this issue. We need to be able to have the working class to live in here. We need to have people to be able to afford to buy and to rent a house in here for the well-being of all of us. If we want to live in a city with a good quality of life, this is a key issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. for that. Deputy Mayor Bailao, on behalf of the Canadian Club of Toronto, I want to thank you for your passion, for your commitment, and for your insight into a topic that is uh, so relevant to all of us. It was also a good reminder that in terms of the tool set that we have, that voodoo is still an option for us in terms of influencing people around us. I hadn't thought of that. I'm so glad that you reminded that we could bring that Portuguese tradition to the forefront here on the housing on the housing front. Before we conclude, before we conclude, let me thank our sponsors. We are very appreciative to uh, Kingset Capital and Layuna for sponsoring today's, today's events. <laughs> Round of applause for them. I also want to make sure we thank MediaEvents.ca, Canada's online event space, and VVC for live streaming today's event. Thank you all for taking time out of your day to join us. We really appreciate it. We hope you will see you again. Have a great day. Thank you.